How are you guys doing? Are the neurons and the synapses in your brain loosened and less frozen and it is cold, it is cold. Did anyone come from out of town? That's what it looks like to not have wisdom. Right there, no skate. I just think that's just calling me out. It's like you're driving going, I don't know, there's a live stream, but no, you are committed, right? We're going to frame it as committed, not a wisdom issue. But uh, welcome to church. In fact, I, we're about to interview someone who came from out of town uh, from Groton. And uh, at this time, we have our, even our interview chairs. We haven't used these for a while, so I'm going to go old school Phil Donahue. But would you welcome... If you're not a certain age, you have no idea what that meant. Uh, I'm going to welcome Miles Morris. Miles, we, we won't sit this close together. That's weird. But uh, the OCD in me is like, I always sit there, but I'm going to live with this. Uh, this is Miles. Everyone say good morning, Miles. My, wow, that was good. Miles is our next elder candidate. And so, Miles, uh, so it's just so we all have a frame of reference, we are an elder ran church. And what that means is there's a group of us as pastors, as elders and lay elders, and together we uh, make up the leadership of the church. And so uh, maybe you come from a Presbyterian background or a Lutheran background like I, or like I did growing up where I was Presbyterian, and it was congregationally led, so everyone voted on everything. Or maybe you have a Baptist background that represents that type of thinking. Or maybe you came from a, a different type of background where there was a pastor and it was his church and he was the man of God. And so uh, our model we feel like is the early church model. And we don't have either of those. Uh, I'm an elder like the rest of the elders, and I'm a, I'm a key elder, and I lead our staff and other pastors, but we are a board and a team, and we make sure decisions together. So we don't vote on the little things of the church, but we do bring before you who the leaders are so you can get to know them. And then we do, in a few weeks, have a vote of affirmation every time we bring on an elder. And so we look in the church as a, as a group of leaders, and we say, who, who's coming through the ranks? Who, who are men that are humble, that are serving, that fit the biblical qualifications of uh, Timothy and Titus and, and how, how the early church operated? And so every so often, we, we feel like, okay, God is raising up a new leader, and we always want to have more lay elders uh, than pastors so that we can kind of keep things healthy. And uh, Miles represents the newest train of thought. And so Miles, as you are praying through this process of being a leader in our church that makes a lot of decisions, could you, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so aside from what you can read in the bio there, um, you know, I, my wife Steph and I started going here around 2016-ish, and um, we really loved it right away. Um, I really specifically love leadership, and uh, I, I told Mike, uh, it's because I'm not particularly good at it, I feel, and it's something I want to improve, and he literally said, uh-oh, right into the microphone. <laughs> but it was, Write that it, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so, but it's something I'm passionate about. It's something I want to learn more, i constantly learning more about, and something I really enjoy, and it, it's very humble to be uh, brought up here and, and be a, suggested for um, this position. So... I, I really love the leadership part. I think that's the biggest thing, aside what you can read in my bio about uh, what what this means for me. Yeah, tell us tell us a bit about kind of where you're from, and if you have a wife named Stephanie, if you have that, and uh, who did your wedding, and how that went, and who the pastor was, and <laughs> where did you grow up, and. What do you do for a living? And just tell us about yourself. So I'm from Northwest Missouri originally. Uh, graduated college. The next day I, I started working. I, I went to Indiana first, and then I came up to South Dakota. Uh, did a two-week internship in South Dakota. The guy I worked for got me back up here. And um, I started working on a ranch uh, east of Redfield. And it wasn't a farmer's daughter situation. It was a farmer's niece. So that uh, my wife Totally said, different. Yeah, it's totally different. Totally different. Uh, it, so... I married my wife 2017 here at the church, and uh, Rod, yes, did the wedding. And, <laughs> um, we we just we've really kind of grown, even though it's maybe not been it's not like it's been 20 years or something, but we've really grown up here at New Life. So uh, we just love this church. I love serving here, and we're going to get into that in a minute. But it's it's just been great, and uh, we have a son Harrison, and we actually have another one on the way in July. So. Well, look at that, and he's sitting next to the Fred boys. Uh, and, a, and then a nephew as well. So he's being corrupted as we speak. Uh, to tell us about kind of how you serve at New Life and, and uh, why you love the church. Yeah, so pretty quick after I started going here, I started serving in children's ministry. I love children's ministry. 
Um, I, I just, it, it's, it's the light bulb moments, and it doesn't matter where you serve, you know this if you serve here, it doesn't matter if it's coffee ministry, it, it, you or someone else, it's those light bulb moments where you get to see something in someone's life, and that's just, it's what I really love about serving, and I, I was with third and fourth graders a lot, uh, that was just kind of where they needed help the most, and just seeing those things with those kids, how the gospel really moves, um, it, it's just amazing, and I get to serve with a lot of really great people. It's a lot of fun, and so I've been in children's ministry uh, almost the whole time I've been going to New Life. Yeah, and so uh, you feel called to leadership, and we've talked this process. We've met with you now as an elder group, and we, I just want you guys to know we, we feel very confident that Miles is a great fit for the church, um, and what really makes him a great fit is his humility and his eagerness to serve, and so Praise God. That, and I think this is also a reflection. There's a lot of godly men in our church. And I think that really is the crux of it. As we raise up uh, people for leadership, it, we, we have this pool to draw from. And, and we've just been saying for a while as pastors, we, we think that you're next. And so uh, what I would challenge you guys with is just to be in prayer uh, for what uh, we're going to vote, an affirmation vote. If this is your home, there's, there's really no, like, you have to be a member. If, if this is your home, this is where you go to church, then you can make that vote of affirmation. And... Uh, and that's all I have to say. And so I would encourage you to talk to Miles. He's going to be around the next few weeks. He'll be between services. Maybe he's already been downtown this morning talking to Micah. And uh, in the next few weeks, just get to know him. Any theological questions you might have, if you want to pick his brain about the deepest, darkest things of the Bible that no one can answer, Miles is your guy. And uh, just, just get to know him. It's, yes, the answer is always Jesus. So um, I'm going to pray for you. Let's all stand up and pray for Miles and, and, and Seth, too, just his family, because this is a big deal. Jesus, we, we love you, and uh, we, we love Miles, and we love Steph, and, the, and we pray for just a blessing on their life. We pray for uh, their children, that they continue just to uh, be the, Miles would be the pastor of his own home first, and as you, as you have now challenged him with this next area of leadership in his life, God, I, I just pray that you would, uh, you would open up the doors for wisdom to be ushered in for humility to be ushered in, and just that he would not just love this church, but he would obey your word, and he protect this church as an elder by being obedient to what you say in the Bible to do. I pray this uh, blessing on his life. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, sir. All right, we can clap for him or however we want to show him we love him. But if you have your Bibles, um, I'll get this. Turn them to the book of 1 John. Is everyone there? While you're going there, I'm going to take this chair and I'm going to move it, okay? Then we're going to get started. We're talking about God. We're talking about Jesus. And we're doing so through the lens of Jesus' best friend, which we covered last week, the apostle, or I'm sorry, the disciple, John, who we know from last week was Jesus is not just friend. What was he? He was his best friend. And so to be the best friend of Jesus is a very high uh, blessing. It's, it's something that there's only one of in the history of the world. And uh, he was loved so much by Jesus. He wasn't just a brother. He was closer than a brother, identified by Jesus on the cross. He's having this interaction at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says to John, the beloved of Jesus, he says, this is my mom, take care of her. I'm paraphrasing. And so then he dies, he rises from death, he goes to be with the Father, and now John is not just someone who's Jesus' best friend, he's a warrior for the kingdom. And so in his early life, he's a son of thunder, he's kind of a loose cannon, he says things that he probably shouldn't. Think of Peter, there's some similarities there. But as he grows in maturity and he grows in wisdom, now he's a pillar of the local church, He's uh, walking with the other apostles. He's the only one of the disciples who's not killed for the faith. They try to kill him, church history tells us. They boil him in water. He doesn't die. He probably wishes he would have when he was in that boiling water. Uh, but he lives to a ripe old age. They exile him to an island. He hears from Jesus or gets to meet Jesus again face to face in a vision. And he writes the book of Revelation. And then at the very end of his life, he's no longer a son of thunder. He's kind of like grandpa john or great grandpa john now as we walk in today's text for the next several weeks in this small book of first john we're going to see grandpa john pouring out wisdom to the church that we want to absorb 
And so there's several resources that you can attach yourself to. Right now, media has different people who have tackled the book of 1 John. Um, you can talk to me about who those, some of those are that I listen to and some of the notes that I take. And, and whenever we go to a short book of the Bible, I'm always taking more notes, listening to more people. And today is absolutely no exception. And so as we walk in this wisdom from Grandpa John, we're going to start right out of the gate. Last week, first four verses. Now we're on five, 1 John chapter 1. This is what John says. He says, this is the message that we have heard from him. And we proclaim to you. Now this is the title of the message, so don't miss this. That God is what? Light. That God is light. 200 references in the Bible to this idea that God is light. And in him there is no, underline that, there's none, not an ounce of, not even a little micro speck of darkness. At all. Right? So... This is the first idea that we're going to walk in. It's going to take us a while. We're going to unpack some, some theology and understanding and philosophy of what this even means and why John would hone in on it. And, uh, and here we go. So number one, God is light. How much darkness is there? None. Not at all. This is a mega theme of, theme of scripture. Every time you turn the lights on, remember that God is light. And light does things. In Genesis 1, uh, chapters three and, or verses 3 and 4, God creates, and he says, let there be light. In Revelation 22, and you have to kind of wrap your mind around this, because this is a bigger idea that's hard to even conceptualize, but it's the last chapter, so you have the first chapter of the Bible, you have the first book of the Bible, you have the last chapter of the Bible, the last book of the Bible, and it's sandwiched between these two ideas that God is light. And in Revelation 22, when Jesus comes back for his bride, there will only be light. There'll be no darkness at all. Uh, you won't even need the sun anymore because the glory of Jesus Christ will illumina illuminate everything. Think this in your mind. Try to get your mind around this. Just the glory of Jesus Christ with no sun will illuminate everything forever. That's a lot of light because God is, in his essence, light. Even the sun, I learned this week, has little dark spots on it. Jesus Christ has none. And so what does light do? Jesus says in John 12, he shows up, he says, I'm the light of the world. And so what light does is it brings healing and it brings revealing. You can even tell like if, you, if there's people I've listened to to get these catchphrases from. But light brings healing and light reveals. It heals and it reveals. Well, what do you mean it heals? Well, in a physical sense, it literally does heal. And in a 17 below with another 30 degrees of wind chill factor, however that even works, it's cold beyond cold beyond cold. Guess what rates start climbing as the weather starts tanking? What is it? Starts with a D. It's depression. Seasonal affect disorder because your body needs sunlight. That doesn't mean we all go move, but it's not a bad idea to get out a little bit in the wintertime. And it, it's like even things you thought you'd never do when it gets bad enough. You're like, well, maybe tanning beds aren't so bad, right? And so you just want light. You want to be in it because it has a healing property to it. And so God creates the physical and God creates the spiritual. And those two things collide sometimes. And this is one of those times where, spiritually speaking, God brings healing. But physically speaking, because God is light, it can bring healing. It doesn't just heal, it also reveals. And so you have lights on in your home. You turn your car on at night and you have headlights. You have now a phone where you always have a flashlight because when you can't see and you don't have clarity and you don't have light shed on something, it can get crazy real quick. But there's a difference, a clear difference in scripture between light and darkness, good and evil. Light means God is good. Darkness is about evil. Light means God is holy. Darkness means people and things are unholy. The enemy is unholy. Light is truth. Darkness is lies. That's a big thing. We're going to go there in just a bit. Light and darkness. They're contrasting principles within scripture. Light gives sight. Darkness brings blindness. Light brings life. Darkness brings death. You can even see this in in the world around us, like plants, if they don't have light, they can literally die. Light is safe, darkness is unsafe. Why are we talking about that so much? It's so practical, because there's something ideological that we want to grab a hold of that I'm about to go on a tangent on right now. Because when it comes to scripture, 
There's a theology within it, the understanding of God, and if you don't understand that, the problem is this, that we all have theological undertones to everything that we operate in. You could say, well, I'm not real big on that stuff. You don't even realize the theology that you walk in. You don't even realize the ideology that maybe you're, you have been even brainwashed in as culture is operating in a set of beliefs that you've adapted to, even in the context of I'm a Christian, and you don't realize how much you've adapted to a worldview that doesn't have a biblical foundation. And so what do I mean by that? In the Bible, and this is where it gets like over my head and I've studied and I've listened. In the Bible, there is an ideology and there is a theology to how God operates. And you see it right with the best friend of Jesus when he says God is light because he's doing something in that moment. And what he's doing in the next few verses is he's taking this thing that we know to be true and he's contrasting it with a lie. And so the ideological undertone is the idea that in the Bible, there's this thing that's known as dualism. Now, you're not going to see the word dualism, but it's an idea that you see flesh out. And it's that there are not just one set of operating beliefs, but there are two. And it's kind of like this idea for every action, there's a reaction. And you see it littered throughout this text. That God is light, here's what I mean, and in him, this is the dualistic reality of how God thinks and operates. God is light, this is who God is. But then at the second part of this discussion is, this is who God isn't. So God is light, and in him there is no what? Darkness. God is holy, and in him there is nothing that is unholy. God is truth, and you're going to see this in a second. In him there is no lies. And so what God creates in his creative order, in his very nature, and who he is, in this dualistic view of how life works is a distinction between things. God creates and he has a creation. Why, why is that important? Because in the world around us, that is not how we view things. In the culture around us, that is not how we view things. For example, pantheism is this idea that God is the force. And so... There is dualism. Write that down. I didn't think of it myself. In fact, I listened to someone smarter than me talk about this whole topic, and I thought this is worth going on a tangent about because it applies so tightly. There is dualism, but the flip side of that is Eastern thought, which is monism, that God is both good and evil. And I don't know. That doesn't really make sense. Well, have you ever heard of the movie Kung Fu Panda? Right? There's some deep theology in there. What are they chasing in Kung Fu Panda? The chi, the life force. You're like, well, I haven't seen Kung Fu Panda because I'm, I have a brain cell and I don't have little kids at home. Well, have you seen Star Wars, all you nerds out there? Who's a Star Wars fan? I am. Right? What, is the, what is this idea of monism in Star Wars? It's called the... Come on, wake up. Unfreeze the neurons. It's called the... The force. Well, how does the force work? The force is the energy that flows in all living things. The creator and creation are one. They don't separate. Everyone has an ideology. It's just a matter of which one that you have. And so when all is one, then you are a part of creation. That's pantheism. That God is the force that is the world. Creation is a part of that force. Think, well, that just seems like something on a sci-fi movie. No, that's Eastern thought. That's mysticism, and it bleeds in the culture, which is why it's worth bringing up, because this is how it actually plays out. Instead of going out to find God, instead of going out to find God that is light, and staying away from that which is not God, which is darkness, dualism, instead we have monism, which says God is in everything, and truth is what you choose to believe, so instead of going out to find God, which is the answer and which is light, to get the healing that you need, you don't need to go out to find God. You can turn in to find God, and you would see things like at a therapeutic level of, I need to find my inner child. You don't need to find your inner child. You need to find the child that grew up to die for your sins and rise from death and the one that is worthy of your worship because he's the only one that can change you. For me, it's personal because I had years of ideological training and therapy that had a starting point that was flawed. You don't find the good in yourself 
because you're the one who's not good. You need Jesus. You need the light. You are not the light. You are not the answer. You need a truth that stands outside of you because you're the problem and broken can't fix broken. So that's kind of the basis for the idea that God is light and him there is no darkness. Another reason it's important walking down the same rabbit trail is that when you don't understand that, you will say things. So how do, how do you know that you've been kind of immersed in this ideology that's not biblical? Well, one of the things you say is, I need to find something, and what I need to find is spirituality. Right? So if everything is one, then what you need is spiritual healing, but in a dualistic mode of operating, it's not that. It's their spirituality, but some spirits are good, and some spiritual are evil. We, we all believe in spirits. We all believe in angels, right, for an example. And angels and demons are both angels, but demons are what? Do you know? They're fallen angels. And so if you would just have this idea of I need spirituality in my life, but you don't understand the right spirits that you can trust, then you're going to say, well, everything's the same, and God is yin and yang, and God is good and evil, and all things are God, and God is in all things, and he's in that tree that I worship over there. And, uh, you know, in that type of thinking, you have that Eastern thought that you're operating in, then you will absolutely operate from a backward standpoint because you don't just need spirituality, you need to discern the spirits. Right? It's, just, it's just as dysfunctional of going, I need relationships, which is true. And so then when you say, I need relationships, that means that you can trust every relationship that's ever formed because no one could ever hurt you. Well, no, you, you have people you can trust and you have people you can't trust because there is good and there is evil, there is right, there is wrong, there is light, there is darkness. Just like all people aren't safe, not all spirits are safe, and just like some things are right, some things are then wrong. And so, this reality plays out all over the place. You, you can think of just modern day examples of trying to take something over here, and then another thing that's over here and just blend them into one, like, like gender issues and things like that, where it's like, well, there's no truth, there's no lies. No, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. And so John's concern, because he's dealing with all sorts of bad theology that's gotten to the church, is what I'm telling you as Grandpa John is that I love you, but I love you too much with the Father's heart at almost 100 years of age to not tell you the truth. There is light and there is darkness, and God is the light, and in him there is no darkness. How much of a loving father would you possibly be if you knew that to be true, and you saw someone walking in darkness about to enter into destruction, and you did nothing about it as a father? That's the heart of John as we move forward. God is way too loving. Verse 6. It'll move faster after this, I promise. So since God is light, verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. If there is this over here, then there's also that over there. There's light and there's darkness, there's truth and there's lies, and when you're in the light, you're in the truth. If you walk in darkness, then you're not walking with God. Well, how do you know you're walking in darkness? That's a great question, right? Here are some variables. You're in rebellion. You're believing lies. You're simply ignoring those things that you know to be true. Well, then how do you walk in darkness? If lying is the mode of operation for walking in darkness, then who do you lie to? I put some things on the screen for you to see that you can write down. One thing I know for sure, just living 43 years of life, which some of you have lived more. Side note, we're setting up church, nothing to do with the message. I had Emmett Fred with me because Greg was singing in the praise band. And I said to Emmett, I said, do you know anyone that's three years old? And Emmett goes, me. And I said, I am 43 years old. And he looked at me and he goes, that's a lot of old. <laughs> so living 43 lots of old life years, there is some wisdom that I can't give you Grandpa John wisdom, but I can give you some wisdom. There are ways that we lie. And one of the things that we do is we lie to ourselves. When we walk in this darkness, we tell ourselves things that we either know aren't true or we want them to be true. And uh, it's a subconscious or it's a conscious level, but we lie to ourselves and we do it all the time. So what, how do we lie to ourselves? Well, we take something that's a big deal and we tell ourselves it's not. Why do we do that? Multiple reasons. One of them is we appease our conscience. 
And there are all sorts of train wreck consequences when we go this way, especially when we claim Christ as Savior, but then we do what we want, when we want, with whom we want, and we say, don't judge me, I don't want to deal with it. And when we lie to ourselves, it produces something. It's this separation from God. We'll get into this in just a second, and the next point as we start closing out. But when you lie to yourself, you separate yourself from God because here's what God is going to say. He's going to say this twice. He's going to say, you don't walk in light. You walk in darkness. And so when you have a close, personal, upfront relationship that's transparent, that's built on truth with anyone that you love, and you go this route, you don't just kind of know them. You walk with them. I want you to underline that word in your Bible. You walk with God. You walk in darkness. The person that you walk with requires a level of intimacy with you that mandates that there's honesty in the relationship. Like I, the verbiage is interesting to me because when you walk with someone, anyone go on like mall walks? Or with your spouse, you, you, you mall walk. You're a mall walker. Or if, you've, if you've ever wanted to work out a problem with someone or get closer to someone or start a dating relationship with someone that you think you're just saying, well, it's just going to be friends. Right? Well, what are the, one of the things that you can do that can lead somewhere else in your life with an intimate relationship that's purely platonic? Just start going on long walks with them. Ann and I, Trinity Bible College, 2001, we walked all around that community, which took five minutes. Over and over and over again, because you can throw your Mac down as a young kid when you are walking with a girl. And if you know the word Mac, then you're from my generation. You can get to know someone when you walk with them. And so when you walk with someone, that's exclusive, or at least it has the potential to be. It has the capacity to know them well, to walk with them side by side. What do you do when you get married? You get walked down the aisle. And then you walk out of the aisle with that person where two just became one. And so when you are walking in light, when you are walking in truth, if you're going to lie to yourself by walking in darkness, you have chosen to walk with the person that's not your bride spiritually. Because that darkness realm, when you walk in that, you're walking with the devil himself. And when you go that route, here's what God will not allow. You cannot walk with your bride. This is common sense, right? You cannot walk with your bride and then an hour later go on another walk with your mistress. No one's cool with that. And so you're lying to yourself when you make sin that is a big deal, not a big deal. You're appeasing your conscience. Who else are you lying to? This is the irony of it. You're lying to God. You're lying to God. 4% of kids 18 through 25, when you're 43, you can say kids. 4% have a biblical worldview. Way more than that have been raised in the church, and they're just dropping like flies. And so they're lying to themselves. And then the irony is we think we can lie to God. You, you can lie to anyone. You can't lie to God. That's the tension that you walk in. Now you're choosing to walk with the wrong partner. It's like Judge Judy, Judy, right? God's eyes are like lie detectors. You can't get away with it. And so you try to do that. And because you know you can't do it, you just put him at an arm's distance and you insult him and you become a little religious if you don't, out, if you don't absolutely just abandon the faith altogether and you become lukewarm and God knows what you're doing and the separation is there because you can't walk with your bride and the mistress. You have to choose this day who you're going to serve. You have to walk in the light. How do you lie? Well, you outright lie. You partially confess. You shift the blame. You change what you believe so it feels better. You start supporting causes because you have to worship something. This is the things that people do when they start living in lies. You start supporting causes that are popular in the world, although they have nothing biblical to offer. They're counter gods. They're forfeit. They're counterfeits. He says, don't just... Operate in the truth. Don't just walk in the truth, but practice the truth. Practice transparency. Tra practice accountability. Practice building trust. We think in terms of something that you tell when we talk about truth. Well, the truth, what is truth? It's, it's something that you tell. It's something that you believe. And the Bible takes it a step further. It says, no, it's something that you walk in. It's something that you operate in. It's something that you live out. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that you own your stuff. That there is this 
congruency between what you say you believe and what you operate in. And that's called leadership. I would never bring Miles on the stage if I thought that he didn't have that quality because do as I say, not as I do, is absolutely a failing model. And so we walk and practice the truth. Here's verses 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light, and as, and as I go here, just kind of any products of the 90s, start thinking of DC Talk. Are you ready? Who in here knows what I'm talking about? I want to be in, okay, so here, <laughs> but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And now here's the theology, here's the transformation. So we get, what are the benefits of, how do we know we're doing this walking in the light thing? We have fellowship with one another. We have these relationships that are bonding because we have a partnership in the gospel. We have the blood of Jesus, his son, cleansing us from all of our sin. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so now it's like this last piece on this five million degree below zero day where we came here, and here's the price of admission. There are absolute benefits of, this is what happens when you're transformed by uh, when you walk in the light, the gospel's taken hold and strong, uh, just claimed your heart. How you know you're doing this, he starts laying this out, that there's a way to know that you're walking in the light. God's not seeking to harm you or shame you. He wants to walk with you. It's not a one-time decision. If you walk at your marriage vows and you never go on your mall walks again, it will drift away. You continually pursue that relationship with God that he for per first pursued for you. And as he is now your groom and you're the bride, you walk with him, and there are benefits of. It happens all the way back in the Old Testament from the very first book of the Bible. Adam and Eve are walking with, in the cool of the garden, who? Whom? God. And so there are benefits of this. Here, here's how it doesn't work. This is a side note. It's not like a tightrope. It's not like, oh my goodness, I've got to have transparency. I've got to walk in truth. There's no darkness in Jesus Christ. And so I have to do these things and I have to white knuckle it. And it's not this tightrope where, and I heard someone talk about this this week, this, this is just absolute religious condemnation where you're walking this tightrope 500 degree or 500 feet above uh, of the ground, and you're just teetering back and forth. This is not how it works with God. And then all of a sudden, you slip up and you fall, and you just fall right into the pits of hell. And so what he's going to say next is the blood of Jesus covers those sins. That's not how it works. That's just religion trying to earn its way to God. Grace is at the center of the gospel story. And so it doesn't work like that. It's not a tightrope. It's way more like this idea that God loves you so much that he's your heavenly father and he knows what's best for you and he wants to walk with you as he is holy and then his son makes you holy and it's not like a tightrope where if you mess up everything collapses. It's more like this and we actually have an analogy happening right before our eyes. Jacob, I'm going to embarrass you just a second. Keep walking out but I want you to see them walking out because it's a perfect analogy and it's not about the fact that Claire needs to leave the sanctuary but watch what he just did. Look at it. You're not looking. Look at it. Claire, say hi. Live stream, you missed it, okay? It just happened prophetically right before my eyes, my sermon illustration. Walking with God isn't a tightrope where you fall, and it's like, oh, I'm just falling into the pits of hell. Walking with God is literally, you're the little kid, that little cute girl, who wasn't even crying. She just had to go, probably had to go to the bathroom. She's walking. What, is she, what is the first thing that Claire just did? She wanted to walk with dad, right? Jake, one of the nicest guys in the whole world. What does she do? Look at me. You should have looked at her. Look at me. Boom. Arm goes up. Why? Exactly. She wants to hold daddy's hand. She wants to hold the father's hand because walking with God is this idea of being a child or having a childlike faith and going, I know that your plans for me are to bring the healing of the light to the gospel that I desperately need, to the forgiveness that I can't find on my own. And when I walk in the light, 
I don't understand you to be a father who's putting me on a tightrope saying, if you mess up, you're gone. I understand you to be a heavenly father who's reaching his hand down to me. And when I reach my hand up, Abba, Abba, Father, now I have safety and I have comfort and the lost has been found. And I know that I'm secure in you and I can trust you because you're dad. Thank you, Claire. And if I'm going to leave the sanctuary, I'm putting my arm up. Or if I'm lost in a grocery store and I find you, I put my arm up. If I'm in a theme park and I can't find you and we connect, I put my arm up because you are the one that's been trusted. You want to know how devastating it is when fathers don't take a biblical mandate to leave their homes? What they teach their child from a very young age is that they can't be trusted to have that arm extended and for it to be reciprocated and they can't trust dad. And when they can't trust dad, we've talked about this before, and all of a sudden now they have a convoluted view of the Heavenly Father. But the Heavenly Father's love and His attributes don't change regardless of our successes or failures as parents. He is the one that can be trusted. And the gospel is this, that He first reaches His arm down to you with His hand to tell you you're safe through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, so that you can raise that arm up and find the comfort. God can be trusted. Walk in the light. The heart of the Father is to extend that arm. He says when you do that, there's these things that trickle down. One of them is you have fellowship with other people. You want healing that only light provides? You have to run for the light. You want to understand forgiveness? You have to run for the light. If you understand, and here's the gospel on display, all the stuff that Jesus has done for you, then your peripheral can be made right. It's like, well, why do, why do I have so much animosity and resentment and brokenness in the peripheral? It's because you're not applying the gospel. People aren't good and evil, and God isn't yin and yang. I mean, it's not monism, it's dualism. There is good and there is evil. There is light and there is darkness. You run to the light and God changes your heart through his son, Jesus Christ. And then he says, you can have fellowship with people. You can have a heart for people because if God has done all of those things for you, now you can be empathetic to those things that you're seeing around you. Because God is a friend to you and a father to you, you can be a friend and a father to the fatherless. You can have authentic empathy in your life. He lays out the theology of how it all works. You can have fellowship with one another because the blood of Jesus, he says, covers your sin. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. The way, the way we pay for sin is because someone has to, and it has to be you because it's your sin. But God is holy, God is just, but he's also loving, and he loves you so much that he has to punish sin. He's going to punish sin. He's holy. That's his number one attribute in the Bible. But he punishes his own son, Jesus Christ, in your place so that you can be made right. And there's no such thing in the Bible as double jeopardy. And so if he punishes his son, Jesus, he's not going to punish you too. And when you understand that, then the trickle-down effect begins. So he says the blood of Jesus is covering the sins in the text. He, he walks through that idea when you're walking in light. He makes this next statement or this next idea, but, but the way that when we get that forgiveness, the way that we unpack that is that we're forgiven as we confess that sin and pursue the light. If we confess, then he's faithful and just to forgive. When we walk in the light, write it down, this is important. If you're not a Christian yet, this is what we believe. When you walk in the light, you confess sin. How do, you, how do you define the idea of confessing sin? What does that mean? Here's the most simplistic answer to that question. You agree with God. God says this, and my confession is, I'm aligning myself in agreement with what he says. I'm not perfect, but I'm believing on the truth of Jesus Christ, and I'm choosing to agree with God. God is the father. We are the kids. How annoying is it? I only use analogies from my own life experience because that's all I've got. But if you've got teenagers, how annoying is it when they give you lip service but they don't align? I, mean, I, I, I know, I know. I mean, I got a teenage daughter, 14, driver's permit. I know, I know, I know eye rolls. Nothing triggers me like an eye roll. Nothing. 
except for the fact that it triggers Anne 10 times more. And she's a good kid, but she's at that stage. And I thought, my little girl will never. And then I saw it happen. And she's a good kid. But I know, I know. And she'll say, you're right. But then you see the eye rolls. And so, you know, it's like, oh, we didn't get to the alignment part. Because that's lip service, but she's not walking in the light. She's not walking in the truth of my parenting. All right, you've been there, done that, anybody? Independence from God is never a good thing. Alignment with God is the mandate. And so the confessing is the agreeing with. It's not just something that you say, your lifestyle aligns. And when you confess... And when the forgiveness pours in, what he promises is that God is faithful. When we confess, God is faithful and just to forgive us. And the beauty of the gospel is the faithfulness of God. And we sing songs like his love never fails. His mercies are new every morning. That he's the one person, no matter what we've been through, that we can always go to. If you've ever been a product or a experience the wrath of unfaithfulness, it brings up the deepest wounds. But God can be trusted because God is faithful as we confess. He never abandons, he never harms, he never shames. He's for you, not against you. And so we don't hide from him, we run to him. And then it's the forgiveness from sin. And lastly, out of all the things he said in verse 7 through 10, as a now 100-year-old man who's been there, done that, saying this is right and this is wrong, What he then unpacks in these last verses that we've already covered, and you can put them back on the screen, is the last idea is that you're forgiven from it, but when you're forgiven from it, don't miss this, you are freed from it. And the reason I know you're freed from it is because he says this, that you're cleansed from the unrighteousness. Something I know as a counselor is that when someone has been violated, and I'll just kind of leave it there, and you can infer what you want. When someone has been through trauma, maybe that's a better way to say it, one of the things they feel, even though they've done nothing wrong, is they feel unclean. They, They want to take a shower. They want to change clothes. They feel traumatized, which they should, and that's the reality of darkness at its deepest level. When we are sinned against, we feel the same way. When we sin against God, we feel the same way. And so we have this arm's distance out because we don't understand the gospel and we just kind of become this religious person that's not transformed. And then some of us are just in complete rebellion and some of us, rebellion just takes different faces. We just have done some things that we go, well, I know that God could technically forgive me, but man, I'm that person that I never wanted to be. And so the beauty of the gospel is that he forgives you, but then he brings freedom with the forgiveness and he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done as you walk in this space, when you humble yourself before the Lord, you are clean. When people would repent in the Bible and and even in the narratives of when they go to the temple, they would get these new white linen clothes. They would be symbolically clean as well, where they would take a a bath and they would have new robes that they would put on And when they would go to the temple. And now Jesus comes, and in the middle of the temple, in the Holy of Holies, the curtain, the veil is broken, and we have direct access to God. We don't have to go through religious means and go to the priest and go to the high priest and follow these ceremonies and kill the fatted calves and, and, you know, and, and sacrifice the spotless lambs because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, and his blood covers the sin. And now we are cleansed, which then means that we're free. And if God is for you, who can be against you? If God can forgive you, then why are you still in condemnation? And so you come into this space, and maybe in your own arrogance, you don't want anything to do with God. But maybe you just feel in your own condemnation that you've gone too far. And he already knows. But when you come to Christ, you wear the white He puts on the new clothes. You're the perfect, you know, you're the bride, he's the groom. You're the perfect bride because he's already done the work at the cross. And so you're forgiven. And as you align with God, you're cleansed. And so then my question as we, the praise band comes back up is this. 
Are you walking in darkness, the duality of the reality, or are you walking in light? Or, here's another one, didn't plan on asking, or are you kind of in your own mind walking in some light and walking in some darkness? I'm not talking about messing up, I'm talking about you know the game that you're playing. And when you choose to play that game, you're not walking in both, you're just walking in darkness and you're trying to mock God. But my question is, if God's convicting you of that and he's grabbing your heart right now in this moment, is my question is, are you willing to lay your life down right now at the foot of the cross, this God of light, his son Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, transformation in the gospel, are you willing in this moment to say, God, I've been playing games, I'm going to choose a new walking partner I'm not walking with both sides of the fence. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. As we take in this information, God, the pe- things I've been listening to this week and the studies and the verses. And as this goes out, as these verses are examined, verses 5 through 10. We see you as this father who's already sent his son to pay that penalty of sin. And you're reaching down your arm. And you've already done the work. And God, I would pray that our hearts would be pure where we would reach that arm back up to you because you've already done it. And we would choose this day who we're going to serve that we confess our sins before you, that we would believe in the gospel this morning, that we choose to walk in light, that we would choose to believe that in you there is no darkness, that we would choose to follow your son who's coming back for us. And when there's no earth or there's no sun in this galaxy that your son, God, is going to light up everything because you are light. So we walk in that reality today. We want to choose you as our walking partner. We pray this in your name. Everybody said, amen. We're going to leave this space in just a little bit. This is a one and done Sunday. It actually feels really weird. That means there was no time limit. I don't know how long I took. But it also means I have nothing after. And so if you want to talk, you want to pray, I'm floating around. We've got elders that are floating around. We have pastors that are floating around. Um, If you're brand new and just want to let us know who you are, we have a starting point and a gift for you. But hopefully today was a reminder of the truth of the gospel. But if you're saying in your heart, man, I need Jesus, don't, don't just walk out of this space and shake my hand like everything's okay. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. On your way out, if you go here and this is your home and this is what you're bought into, then you can leave your tithe and your offering here or online. But at this time, we're going to stand up. We're going to sing one more song. In fact, I, I just changed my game plan. I'm going to stick around. If you just want to pray after service, I'm here. We're going to sing one more song. You want to talk? You want to pray? I'm here. Chuck's here. Greg will get done on the guitar. We can pray for you. Elders can pray for you. We're going to sing one more song right now.